The Battle of Mazines was an attack by the British Second Army, on the Western Front, near the village of Mazines in West Flanders, Belgium, during the First World War. The Nivelle Offensive in April and May had failed to achieve its more grandiose aims, had led to the demoralization of French troops and confounded the Anglo-French strategy for 1917. The attack forced the Germans to move reserves to Flanders from the Arras and Aisne fronts, relieving pressure on the French. The British tactical objective was to capture the German defences on the ridge, which ran from Plugsted Wood in the south, through Mazines and Wycheek to Mount Sorrel, depriving the German 4th Army of the high ground. The ridge gave commanding views of the British defences and back areas of Ypres to the north, from which the British intended to conduct the northern operation, and advance to Passchendaele Ridge and then the capture the Belgian coast up to the Dutch frontier. The Second Army had five corps, three for the attack and two on the northern flank, not part the operation, 14 Corps, was available in General Headquarters Reserve. The 4th Army divisions of Group Wycheat held the ridge and were later reinforced by a division from Group Ypres. The British attacked with the 2nd Anzac Corps, 9 Corps, 16th Irish, and 19th Divisions and the 11th Division in Reserve, X Corps and 23rd Divisions with the 24th Division in Reserve. 14 Corps in Reserve. The 30th, 55th, 39th and 38th Divisions in 2 Corps and 8 Corps, guarded the northern flank and made probing attacks on the 8th of June. Grupa Weidjate held the ridge with the 204th, 35th, 2nd, 3rd Bavarian and 4th Bavarian Divisions, with the 7th Division and 1st Guard Reserve Division as Eingreif Divisions. The 24th Saxon Division, relieved on 5 June, was rushed back when the attack began and the 11th Division, in Gruppe Ypern Reserve, arrived on 8 June. The battle began with the detonation of 19 mines beneath the German front position, which devastated it and left 19 large craters. A creeping barrage, 700 yards deep began and protected the British troops as they secured the ridge with support from tanks, cavalry patrols and aircraft. The effect of the British mines, barrages and bombardments was improved by advances in artillery survey, flash spotting and centralised control of artillery from the Second Army headquarters. British attacks from 8 to 14 June advanced the front line beyond the former German Seinenstellung. The battle was a prelude to the much larger Third Battle of Ypres, the preliminary bombardment for which began on the 11th of July 1917. Chapter 1 – Background Chapter 1 – Section 1 – British Plans 1916-1917 In 1916, the British planned to clear the Germans from the Belgian coast, to deny them the use of the ports as naval bases. In January, Plumer recommended to Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig, the capture of Mazines Ridge before an operation to capture the Gaeleveld Plateau further north. The highest ground north of the Mazines Wycheat Ridge lies on the Menin Road, between Hooge and Veldhoek, 1.5 miles from Gaeleveld, at the west end of the main Ypres Ridge, which runs from Ypres, east to Broodsend and then northeast to Passchendaele, Westrusebeek, and Staden. The British called it the Gaeleveld Plateau or Menin Ridge. Roads and tracks converged on the Menin Road at this point. The east end of the Gaeleveld Plateau was on the west side of Polygon Wood. A flat spur either side of the Menin Road ran about 3.5 miles southeastwards towards Cruisake and was about one mile wide at Veldhoek, with a depression on the west side through which the Basevelebeek flowed southwards and another on the east side through which the Reutelbeek also flowed south. The spur widened to almost two miles between Veldhoek and Gaeleveld. A Flanders campaign was postponed because of the Battle of Verdun in 1916 and the demands of the Battle of the Somme. When it became apparent that the Second Battle of the Aisne had failed to achieve its most ambitious objectives, Hay instructed the Second Army to capture the Mazines Wycheat Ridge as soon as possible. British operations in Flanders would relieve pressure on the French armies on the Aisne, where demoralisation amid the failure of the Nivelle Offensive had led to mutinies. The capture of Mazines Ridge would give the British control of the tactically important ground on the southern flank of the Ypres salient, shorten the front and deprive the Germans of observation over British positions further north. 
the British would gain observation of the southern slope of Menin Ridge at the west end of the Gelevelt Plateau, ready for the northern operation. The front line around Ypres had changed little since the end of the Second Battle of Ypres. The British held the city and the Germans held the high ground of the Mazines Wycheed Ridge to the south, the lower ridges to the east, and the flat ground to the north. The term high ground is relative, Passchendaele is on a ridge about 70 feet above the surrounding plains. The Gaelevelt Plateau is about 100 feet above the vicinity and Wycheat is about 150 feet higher than the plain, control of the ground was vital for artillery observation. The Ypres front was a salient bulging into the German lines and was overlooked by German artillery observers on the higher ground. The British had little ground observation of the German rear areas and valleys east of the ridges. The ridges run north and east from Mazines, 264 feet above sea level at its highest point, past Clapham Junction at the west end of the Gaelevelt Plateau, 2.5 miles from Ypres at 213 feet and Gaelevelt, above 164 feet, to Passchendaele 5.5 miles from Ypres at 164 feet, declining from there into the plain further north. Gradients vary from negligible to 160 at Hooge and 133 at Zonnebeck. Underneath the soil is London clay, sand and silt. According to the Commonwealth War Graves Commission criteria of sand, sandy soils and well-balanced soils, Mazines Ridge is well-balanced soil, drained by many streams, canals and ditches, which needed regular maintenance. Since the First Battle of Ypres in 1914, much of the drainage in the area had been destroyed by artillery fire, although some repairs had been achieved by army land drainage companies brought from England. The area was considered by the British to be drier than Luz, Givenchy Les Labassais and Plug Street would further south. Chapter 2, Prelude Chapter 2 Section 1, British Offensive Preparations the Second Army centralized its artillery and devised a plan of great sophistication, following the precedent set at the Battle of Arras in April. The use of field survey, gun calibration, weather data and a new and highly accurate 1 colon 10 scale map, much improved artillery accuracy. Systematic target finding was established by the use of new sound ranging equipment, better organization of flash spotting and the communication of results through the Army Report Center at Loka Chateau. Counter-battery artillery bombardments increased from 12 in the week ending 19 April, to 438 in the last 10 days before the attack. A survey of captured ground after the battle found that 90% of the German artillery positions had been plotted. The Second Field Survey Company also assisted mining companies by establishing the positions of objectives within the German lines, using intersection and a special series of aerial photographs. The company surveyed advanced artillery positions for guns to be moved forward to them and open fire as soon as they arrived. But the British had begun a mining offensive against the Weichtschat Bogen in 1916. Subsurface conditions were especially complex and separate ground water tables made mining difficult. Two military geologists assisted the miners from March 1916, including Edgeworth David, who planned the system of mines. Sappers dug the tunnels into a layer of blue clay 80 to 120 feet underground, then drifted galleries for 5,964 yards to points deep underneath the front position of Gruppe Weichgate, despite German countermining. German tunnelers came close to several British mine chambers, found the mine at La Petite Du Farm and wrecked the chamber with a camouflet. The British diverted the attention of German miners from their deepest galleries by making many secondary attacks in the upper levels. Coordinated by tunneling companies of the Royal Engineers, Canadian, Australian, New Zealand and British miners laid 26 mines with 447 long tons of ammonal explosive. Two mines were laid at Hill 60 on the northern flank, one at St. Eloy, three at Hollandsky Schuur, two at Petty Boys, one each at Maidelstedt Farm, Peckham House, and Spanbrook Molen, four at Kruistra, one at Ontario Farm and two each at Trenches 127 and 122 on the southern flank. One of the largest of the mines was at Spanbrookmolen, 
Lone Tree Crater formed by the blast of 91,000 pounds of ammonal in a chamber at the end of a gallery 1,710 feet long, 88 feet below ground was 250 feet in diameter and 40 feet deep. The British knew of the importance the Germans placed on holding the Weichgate salient, after a captured corps order from Gruppe Weichgate stating that the salient be held at all costs was received by Haig on 1 June. In the week before the attack, 2,230 guns and howitzers bombarded the German trenches, cut wire, destroyed strongpoints and conducted counter-battery fire against 630 German artillery pieces, using 3,561,530 shells. The 4th Army artillery consisted of 236 field guns, 108 field howitzers, 54 100-130 mm guns, 24 150 mm guns, 174 medium howitzers, 40 heavy howitzers and 4 heavy 210 mm and 240 mm guns. In May, the 4th Australian Division, 11th Division and the 24th Division were transferred from Arras as reserve divisions for the 2nd Army Corps in the attack on Mazines Ridge. 72 of the new Mark IV tanks also arrived in May and were hidden southwest of Ypres. British aircraft began to move north from the Arras front, the total rising to about 300 operational aircraft in the 2nd Brigade RFC area. The mass of artillery to be used in the attack was supported by many artillery observation and photographic reconnaissance aircraft, in the core squadrons which had been increased from 12 to 18 aircraft each. Strict enforcement of wireless procedure allowed a reduction of the minimum distance between observation aircraft from 1,000 yards at Arras in April to 400 yards at Mazines, without mutual wireless interference. Wire-cutting bombardments began on 21 May and two days were added to the bombardment for more counter-battery fire. The main bombardment began on 31 May, with only one day of poor weather before the attack. Two flights of each observation squadron concentrated on counter-battery observation and one became a bombardment flight, working with particular artillery bombardment groups for wire-cutting and trench destruction, these flights were to become contact patrols to observe the positions of British troops once the assault began. The attack barrage was rehearsed on 3 June to allow British air observers to plot masked German batteries which mainly remained hidden but many minor flaws in the British barrage were reported. A repeat performance on 5 June, induced a larger number of hidden German batteries to reveal themselves. The 25th Division made its preparations on a front from the Wolvergham Mazines Road to the Wolvergham Wycheat Road, facing 1,200 yards of the German front line, which tapered to the final objective, 700 yards wide, at the near crest of the ridge, 3,000 yards distant, behind nine German defensive lines. The advance would begin up a short rise to the near edge of the Steenbeek Valley, then up the steep rise from the valley floor between Hell and Sloping Roof Farms to Four Huns, Chest and Middle Farms on the main ridge, with Lum Farm on the left flank of the objective. Artillery emplacements for the 25th Divisional Artillery and 112th Army Field Brigade were built and the Guards Division Field Artillery was placed in concealed forward positions. Road making and the construction of dugouts and communication trenches took place first between 12 and 30 April and then between 11 May and 6 June. In three hours, an assembly trench was dug 150 yards from the German front line on the night of 30-31 May, complete with communication trenches and barbed wire. Bridges and ladders were delivered in the two days before the attack. 13,000 yards of telephone cable was dug in at least 7 feet deep, which withstood 50 German artillery hits before the British attack. Large numbers of posts for machine guns to fire an overhead barrage were built and protective pits were dug for mules, each of which was to carry 2,000 rounds of ammunition to advanced troops. Three field companies of engineers with a pioneer battalion were kept in reserve, to follow up the attacking infantry, rebuild roads and work on defensive positions as ground was consolidated. The divisional artillery devised a creeping and standing barrage plan and timetable, tailored to the estimated rates of advance of the infantry. 
The standing barrage lifts were to keep all trenches within 1,500 yards of the infantry under continuous fire. The 4.5-inch howitzer, 6-inch howitzer and 8-inch howitzers involved, were to change targets only when infantry got within 300 yards. The 18-pounder field gun standing barrages would then jump over the creeping barrages to the next series of objectives. The concealed guns of the Guards Division Field Artillery were to join the creeping barrage for the advance at 4.50 a.m. and at 7 a.m. the 112th Army Field Brigade was to advance to the old front line, to be ready for an anticipated German counterattack by 11 o'clock a.m. The 47th Division planned to attack with two brigades, each reinforced by a battalion from the Reserve Brigade, along either side of the Ypres Comines Canal. Large numbers of machine guns were organized to fire offensive and defensive barrages and signal detachments were organized to advance with the infantry. An observation balloon was reserved for messages by signal lamp from the front line, as insurance against the failure of telephone lines and message runners. The divisional trench mortar batteries were to bombard the German front line opposite the 142nd Brigade, where it was too close for the artillery to shell without endangering British troops. Wire cutting began in mid-May, against considerable local retaliation by German artillery. At the end of May the two attacking brigades went to Steenvoort to train on practice courses built to resemble the German positions, using air reconnaissance photographs to mark the positions of machine gun posts and hidden barbed wire. Divisional intelligence, summaries were used to plan the capture of German company and battalion headquarters. The 140th Brigade, with four tanks attached, was to occupy White Chateau and the adjacent part of Damstrasse, while the 142nd Brigade attacked the spoil heaps and the canal bank to the left. On the 1st of June, the British artillery began the intense stage of the preparatory bombardment for trench destruction and wire cutting, the two attacking brigades assembled for the attack from 4 to 6 June. British fighter aircraft tried to prevent German artillery observation aircraft from operating by dominating the air from the British front line to the German balloon line, about 10,000 yards beyond. Better aircraft like the Bristol fighter, S.E.5A and the Royal Naval Air Service Sopwith Triplane had entered service since Arras and matched the performance of German Albatross D3 and Halberstadt D2 fighters. For the week before the attack, the barrage line was patrolled all day by fighters at 15,000 feet with more aircraft at 12,000 feet in the center of the attack front. No British Corps aircraft were shot down by German aircraft until 7 June when 29 Corps aircraft were able to direct artillery fire simultaneously over the three attacking Corps. Behind the barrage line lay a second line of defense, which used wireless interception to take bearings on German artillery observation aircraft, to guide British aircraft into areas where German flights were most frequent. By June 1917, each British army had a control post of two aeroplane compass stations and an aeroplane intercepting station, linked by telephone to the Army Wing Headquarters, fighter squadrons, the anti-aircraft commander and the Corps Heavy Artillery Headquarters. The new anti-aircraft communication links allowed areas threatened by German bombardment to be warned, German artillery spotting aircraft to be attacked and German artillery batteries to be fired on when they revealed themselves. From 1 to 7 June, the 2nd Brigade RFC of 47 calls from wireless interception, shot down one German aircraft, damaged seven and stopped 22 German artillery bombardments. Normal offensive patrols continued beyond the barrage line out to a line from Ypres to Rulers and Menin, where large formations of British and German aircraft clashed in long dogfights, once German air reinforcements began operating in the area. Longer-range bombing and reconnaissance flights concentrated on German-occupied airfields and railway stations and the night bombing specialists of 100 squadron attacked trains around Lille, Courtrai, Rulers, and Comines. Two squadrons were reserved for close air support on the battlefield and low attacks on German airfields. Chapter 2 Section 2 Plan of Attack The British planned to advance on a 17,000 yards front, from St. Yves to Mount Sorrel, eastwards to the Oestavern line, a maximum depth of 3,000 yards. Three intermediate objectives, 
originally to be reached a day at a time, became halts, where fresh infantry would leapfrog through to gain the ridge in one day. In the afternoon a further advance down the ridge was to be made. The attack was to be conducted by three corps of the Second Army. Two Anzac Corps in the southeast was to advance 800 yards, Nine Corps in the center was to attack on a 5,000 yards front, which would taper to 2,000 yards at the summit and X Corps in the north had an attack front 1,200 yards wide. The Corps planned their attacks under the supervision of the Army commander, using analyses of the Somme operations of 1916 and successful features of the attack at Arras on 9 April as guides. Great care was taken in the planning of counter-battery fire, the artillery barrage timetable and machine gun barrages. German artillery positions and the second position were not visible to British ground observers. For observation over the rear slopes of the ridge, 300 aircraft were concentrated in two brigade RFC and eight balloons of two kite balloon wing, were placed 3,000 to 5,000 feet behind the British front line. The Second Army Artillery Commander, Major General George Franks, coordinated the corps artillery plans, particularly the heavy artillery arrangements to suppress German artillery, which were devised by the corps and divisional artillery commanders. The Second Army Report Center at Loka Chateau was linked by buried cable to each corps report center, corps heavy artillery headquarters, divisional artillery headquarters, RFC squadrons, balloon headquarters, Survey stations and wireless stations. Responsibility for counter battery fire was given to a counter battery staff officer with a small staff, who concentrated exclusively on the defeat of the German artillery. A conference was held each evening by the counter battery staffs of divisions and corps, methodically to collate the day's reports from observation aircraft and balloons, field survey companies, sound ranging sections, and forward observation officers. Each corps had a counter battery area which was divided into zones and allotted to heavy artillery groups. Each heavy artillery group headquarters divided their zones into map squares, which were allotted to artillery batteries, to be ready swiftly to open fire on them. The attacking corps organized their heavy artillery within the army plan and according to local conditions. Two Anzac Corps created four counter-battery groups, each with one heavy artillery group and nine corps arranged four similar groups and five bombardment groups, one for each of its three divisions and two in reserve, under the control of the corps heavy artillery commander. A heavy artillery group commander was attached to each divisional artillery headquarters, to command the heavy artillery once the infantry attack began. Field artillery arrangements within corps also varied, in nine corps groups and subgroups were formed so that infantry brigades had an artillery liaison officer and two subgroups, one with six 18-pounder batteries and one with six 4.5-inch howitzer batteries. Surplus field artillery brigade headquarters planned forward moves for the guns and were kept ready to replace casualties. It was expected that much of the artillery would need to switch rapidly from the bombardment plan to engage counter-attacking German infantry. It was planned that the forward observation officers of the divisions in the first attack onto the ridge would control the artillery which had remained in place and the reserve divisions advancing down the far slope to the Oestavern line would control the artillery hidden close to the front line and the artillery which advanced into no man's land. Franks planned to neutralize German guns within 9,000 yards of the attack front. On the flanks of the British attack front of 17,000 yards, 169 German guns had been located, for which 42 British guns were set aside. The 299 German guns in the path of the attack were each to be engaged by a British gun, a formula which required 341 British guns and howitzers to be reserved for counter-battery fire. Every 45 yards of front had a medium or heavy howitzer for bombardment, which required 378 guns, with 38 super-heavy guns and howitzers deployed with the field artillery that was due to fire the creeping and standing barrages. Franks devised a bombardment timetable and added arrangements for a massed machine gun barrage. The 756 medium and heavy guns and howitzers were organized in 40 groups and the 1510 field guns and howitzers in 64 field artillery brigades within the attacking divisions and 33 army field artillery brigades, divided among the three attacking corps, 
144,000 long tons of ammunition was delivered, 1,000 shells for each 18-pounder, 750 shells per 4.5-inch howitzer, 500 rounds for each medium and heavy piece and another 120,000 gas and 60,000 smoke shells for the 18-pounder field guns. Two-thirds of the 18-pounders were to fire a creeping barrage of shrapnel immediately ahead of the advance, while the remainder of the field guns and 4.5-inch howitzers were to fire a standing barrage, 700 yards further ahead on German positions, lifting to the next target when the infantry came within 400 yards of the barrage. Each division was given four extra batteries of field artillery, which could be withdrawn from the barrage at the divisional commander's discretion to engage local targets. The field batteries of the three reserve divisions were placed in camouflaged positions close to the British front line. As each objective was taken by the infantry, the creeping barrage was to pause 150 to 300 yards ahead and become a standing barrage while the infantry consolidated. During this time the pace of fire was to slacken to one round per gun per minute, allowing the gun crews a respite, before resuming full intensity as the barrage moved on. The heavy and super-heavy artillery was to fire on German artillery positions and rear areas and 700 machine guns were to fire a barrage over the heads of the advancing troops. At 3 a.m. the mines were to be detonated, followed by the attack of nine divisions onto the ridge. The blue line was to be occupied by 0 plus 140 hours followed by a two-hour pause. At 0 plus 340 hours the advance to the black line would begin and consolidation was to start by 0 plus 5 hours. Fresh troops from the unengaged brigades of the attacking divisions or from the reserve divisions would then pass through, to attack the Oestavern line at 0 plus 10 hours. As soon as the black line was captured, all guns were to bombard the Oestavern line, conduct counter-battery fire and place a standing barrage beyond the black line. All operational tanks were to join with the 24 held in reserve, to support the infantry advance to the Oestavern line. Chapter 2 Section 3 – German Defensive Preparations The Mazines defences were on a forward slope and could be overlooked from Oberdon Hill, the south end of the Douve Valley and Kemmel Hill, 5,000 yards west of Weichgate, an arrangement which the experience of 1916 showed to be obsolete. A new line, incorporating the revised principles of defence derived from the experience of the Battle of the Somme, known as the Flandern Stellung, began in February 1917. The first section began six miles behind Mazines Ridge, running north from the Lys to Linsalis then Werwick and Bissell Air, where the nearest areas giving good artillery observation to the west were found. In April, Field Marshal Crown Prince Ruprecht and his Chief of Staff, General Leftman Hermann von Kuhl, favoured withdrawal to the Warnerton Line, before a British attack. The local divisional commanders objected, due to their belief that countermining had neutralised the British underground threat and the inadequacy of the Warnerton Line. The convex eastern slope limited artillery observation and the Ypres Comines Canal and the River Lys restricted the space below the ridge where infantry could manoeuvre for counterattacks. British observation from the ridge would make the ground to the east untenable as far as the Flandenstelung six miles beyond. A withdrawal to the Flandenstelung would endanger the southern slopes of Menin Ridge, the most important area of the Flandenstelung. Ruprecht re-examined the Warnerton Line and the extra Seinenstelung between the Warnerton Line and the Hohenstelung and dropped the withdrawal proposal. SFN Vertical Bar Win Vertical Bar 1976 Vertical Bar PP equals 262 to 263 Gruppe Weichstadt of the 4th Army, with three divisions under the command of the headquarters of 19 Corps, held the ridge and was reinforced with the 24th Division in early May. The 35th and 3rd Bavarian Divisions were brought up as Eingreif Divisions and Gruppe Weichstadt, was substantially reinforced with artillery, ammunition and aircraft. The vulnerability of the northern end of Mazines Ridge, where it met the Menin Ridge, led to the German command limiting the frontage of the 204th Division to 2,600 yards. The 24th Division to the south held 2,800 yards and the 2nd Division at Weichstadt held 4,000 yards. In the southeast, 
4,800 yards of the front line either side of the River Douve, was defended by the 40th Division. The front line was lightly held, with fortifications distributed up to half a mile behind the front line. At the end of May, British artillery fire was so damaging that the 24th and 40th Divisions were relieved by the 35th and 3rd Bavarian Divisions, which were replaced by the 7th and 1st Guard Reserve Divisions in early June, relief of the 2nd Division was promised for 7-8th of June. The German frontline regiments held areas, 700 to 1,200 yards wide with one battalion forward, one battalion in support and the third in reserve 3 to 4 miles back. The Kampf Battalion usually had three companies in the front system and one in the Sohn line between the front system, and the Hohenstellung on the ridge crest. The other three companies of the support battalion sheltered in the Hohenstellung. About 32 machine gun posts per regimental sector were dispersed around the defensive zone. The German defense was intended to be mobile and Stostrup and Inik the third breastwork had to conduct immediate counterattacks to recapture Yar and Ib. If they had to fall back, the support battalions would advance to restore the front system, except at Spanbrook Molen Hill, which due to its importance was to be held at all costs. On 8 May, the British preliminary bombardment began and on 23 May became much heavier. The breastworks of the front defences were demolished and concrete shelters on both sides of the ridge were systematically destroyed. Air superiority allowed the British artillery observation aircraft to cruise over the German defences, despite the efforts of Jagdschwader 1. On 26 May, the German front garrisons were ordered to move forward 50 yards into shell holes in no man's land at dawn and return to their shelters at night. When the shelters were destroyed, shell hole positions were made permanent, as were those of the companies further back. Troops in the Hohenstellung were withdrawn behind the ridge and by the end of May, the front battalions changed every two days instead of every five, due to the effect of the British bombardment. Some German troops on the ridge were convinced of the mine danger and their morale was depressed further by the statement of a prisoner taken on 6 June, that the attack would be synchronized with mine explosions. On 1 June, the British bombardment became more intense and nearly every German defensive position on the forward slope, was obliterated. The Luftstreitkraft effort reached its maximum on 4 and 5 June, when German aircraft observed 74 counter-battery shoots and wireless interception by the British showed 62 German aircraft, escorted by up to seven fighters each, directing artillery fire against the Second Army. British air observation on the reverse slope was less effective than in the foreground but the villages of Maisen and Weidschate were demolished, as were much of the Hohenstellung and Seinenstellung, although many pillboxes survived. Long-range fire on Comines, Warnerton, Werwick and villages, road junctions, railways and bridges caused much damage and a number of ammunition dumps were destroyed. Chapter 3, Rattle Chapter 3 Section 1, Second Army Fine weather was forecast for the 4th of June, with perhaps a morning haze. Zero day was fixed for the 7th of June, with zero hour at 3.10 a.m., when it was expected that a man could be seen from the west at 100 yards. There was a thunderstorm in the evening of the 6th of June but by midnight the sky had cleared and at 2 a.m., British aircraft cruised over the German lines to camouflage the sound of tanks as they drove to their starting points. By 3 a.m., the attacking troops had reached their jumping-off positions unnoticed, except for some in the 2nd Anzac Corps area. Routine British artillery night firing stopped around half an hour before dawn and bird song could be heard. At 3.10 a.m. the mines began to detonate. After the explosions, the British artillery began to fire at maximum rate. A creeping barrage in three belts 700 yards deep began and counter-battery groups bombarded all known German artillery positions with gas shell. The nine attacking divisions and the three in reserve began their advance as the German artillery reply came scattered and late, falling on British assembly trenches after they had been vacated. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 2 First Objective the second Anzac Corps objective was the southern part of the ridge and Mazines village. 
The 3rd Australian Division on the right, had been disorganised by a German gas bombardment on Plugstedt Wood around midnight, which caused 500 casualties during the approach march but the attack between St. Eve and the River Douve began on time. The 9th and 10th Brigades benefited from four mine explosions at trenches 122 and 127, which were seven seconds early and left craters 200 feet wide and 20 feet deep. The craters disrupted the Australian attack formation, some infantry lines merging into a wave before reforming as they advanced. The New Zealand Division approached over Hill 63 and avoided the German gas bombardment. The two attacking brigades crossed the dry riverbed of the Steenebeck and took the German front line, despite the mine at La Petite Duve Farm not being fired and then advanced towards Mazines village. On the left of the Corps, the 25th Division began its advance 600 yards further back than the New Zealand Division but quickly caught up, helped by the mine at Ontario Farm. On the right of 9 Corps, the 36th Division attack on the front of the 107th Brigade, was supported by three mines at Cruistra and the big mine at Spanbrook Molen, 800 yards further north. The 109th Brigade on the left was helped by a mine at Peckham House and the devastated area was crossed without resistance, as German survivors in the area had been stunned by the mine explosions. The 16th Division attacked between Maidelstead Farm and the Viestra Wycheat Road. The mines at Maidelstead, and the two at Petty Boys devastated the defence, the mines at Petty Boys on the left were about 12 seconds late, and knocked over some of the advancing British infantry. On the left of Nine Corps, the 19th Division, north of the Viestra Wycheat Road, attacked with two brigades into the remains of Grand Boys and Boys Quaranti. Three mine explosions at Hollandsky Schuer allowed the infantry to take a dangerous salient at Nag's Nose, as German survivors surrendered or retreated. X Corps had a relatively short advance of 700 yards to the crest and another 600 yards across the summit, which would uncover the German defences further north on the southern slope of the Gelevelt Plateau, and the ground back to Zanvoord. The German defences had been strengthened and had about double the normal infantry garrison. The German artillery concentration around Zanvoord made a British attack in the area highly vulnerable but the British counter-battery effort suppressed the German artillery, its replies being late and ragged. On the night of 6-7 the 7th of June, gaps were cut in the British wire to allow the troops to assemble in no man's land, ready to attack at 310A.M. The 41st Division attacked with two brigades past a mine under the St. Eloy salient, finding the main obstacle to be wreckage caused by the explosion. The 47th and 23rd Divisions formed the left defensive flank of the attack, advancing onto the ridge around the Procomines Canal and Railway, past the mines at Caterpillar and Hill 60. The cuttings of the canal and railway were a warren of German dugouts but the 47th Division, advancing close up to the creeping barrage, crossed the 300 yards of the German front position in 15 minutes, German infantry surrendering along the way. Soft ground in the valley south of Mount Sorrel, led the two infantry brigades of the 23rd Division to advance on either side up to the near crest of the ridge, arriving while the ground still shook from the mines at Hill 60. In the areas of the mine explosions, the British infantry found dead, wounded and stunned German soldiers. The attackers swept through the gaps in the German defences as Germans further back hurriedly withdrew. About 80,000 British troops advanced up the slope, the creeping bombardment throwing up lots of smoke and dust, which blocked the view of the German defenders. The barrage moved at 100 yards in two minutes, which allowed the leading troops to rush or outflank German strong points and machine gun nests. Where the Germans were able to resist, they were engaged with rifle grenades, Lewis guns and trench mortars, while riflemen and bombers worked behind them. Pillbox fighting tactics had been a great success at the Battle of Vimy Ridge in April and in training for the attack at Mazines, the same methods were adopted along with emphasis on mopping up captured ground, to ensure that bypassed German troops could not engage advancing troops from behind. In the smoke and dust, direction was kept by compass and the German forward zone was easily overrun in the 35 minutes allotted, as was the Sohn line, halfway to the German Hohenstellung on the ridge. 
the two supporting battalions of the attacking brigades leapfrogged through, to advance to the second objective on the near crest of the ridge 500 to 800 yards further on. The accuracy of the British barrage was maintained and local German counterattack attempts were stifled. As the infantry approached the German second line, resistance increased. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 3 Second Objective In the 2nd Anzac Corps area, the 3rd Australian Division consolidated the southern defensive flank of the attack, digging in astride the River Douve with its right in the new craters at Trench 122, defeating several hasty German counter-attacks, the left flank of the division was anchored by a captured German strongpoint. The New Zealand division attacked Mazines village, the southern bastion of the German defences on the ridge. The village had been fortified with a line of trenches around the outskirts and an inner defence zone comprising five pillboxes and all the house cellars, which had been converted into shellproof dugouts. Two machine gun posts on the edge of the village were rushed but fire from Swain's farm 400 yards north held up the advance, until a tank drove through it and caused 30 German troops to surrender. The New Zealanders penetrated the outer trenches behind the creeping barrage, which slowed to 100 yards in 11 minutes. The German garrison defended the village with great determination, before surrendering when the garrison commander was captured. The 25th Division took the Mazines Wycheat Road on the ridge, north of the New Zealand Division with little opposition except at Hell Farm, which was eventually overrun. In the 9th Corps area, the 36th Division captured the wreckage of two woods and Bogart Farm in between, finding that the artillery fire had cut the masses of barbed wire and destroyed many strongpoints. Further north, the 16th and 19th Divisions advanced through the remains of Wycheat Wood and Grand Boys which had been hit by a 2000 oil drum livens projector bombardment on the night of 3-4 June and by standing barrages on all the known German positions in the woods. A German force at La Spice held out despite being bypassed, until 6.48 am and the objective was reached just after 5 o'clock a.m. German positions at Damstrasse, which ran from the St. Eloy Road to White Chateau, in the ex-corps area, fell to the 41st Division after a long fight. White Chateau was attacked by the 47th Division as it advanced to the first objective, covered by smoke and thermite shells fired on the German positions further to the north, along the Comines Canal. The German garrison fought hard and repulsed two attacks, before surrendering after a trench mortar bombardment at 7.50 am the northern defensive flank was maintained by the 23rd Division, with an advance of 300 yards in 20 minutes. A German force at the head of the Zwartelin re-entrant, south of Mount Sorrel where the two attacking brigades met, held out until forced to surrender by volleys of rifle grenades. Just after 5 am the British second intermediate objective, the first trench of the Hohenstellung, on the near crest of the ridge, had been taken. German documents gleaned from the battlefield showed that they expected the forward crest of the ridge to be held until the Eingreif divisions arrived to counterattack. The next objective was the rear trench of the Hohenstellung and the rear crest of the ridge, 400 to 500 yards away. There was a pause of two hours, for fresh battalions to move forward, and the captured ground to be consolidated. About 300 yards beyond the forward positions, a protective bombardment by 18-pounders swept back and forth, while the heavier artillery stood ready to respond with SOS barrages. Pack animals and men carrying Yukon packs, brought supplies into the captured ground and engineers, supervised the digging and wiring of strongpoints. At 7 a.m. the protective bombardment increased in intensity and began to creep forward again, moving at 100 yards in three minutes, as some divisions used battalions from their 3rd Brigade and other divisions those that had attacked earlier. Most of the tanks still operational were outstripped but some caught up the infantry. Fresh battalions of the New Zealand Division leapfrogged through the battalions which had attacked earlier, advancing either side of Mazines, where some German posts still held out. A German artillery headquarters at Blauen Molen, 500 yards beyond Mazines, was captured and a tank broke into a strong point at Fanny's farm, causing a hundred Germans to surrender. The reserve brigade of the 25th Division continued the advance to the north except at Lum Farm, 
which was eventually taken with assistance from the right flank troops of the 36th Division. Helped by two tanks, the rest of the 36th Division advanced to the right of Wycheat village and captured a German battalion headquarters. Wycheat had been fortified like Mazines but special bombardments fired on 3 June had demolished the village. Two battalions of the 16th Division overran the German survivors and on the left, the reserve brigade of the 19th Division took the area from Wycheat village to Ostervern Wood with little resistance. X Corps had greater difficulty reaching some of its final objectives, the loss of White Chateau disorganized the German defenders adjacent to the south. The 41st Division easily crossed the summit and reached the rear slope of the ridge 500 yards away, which overlooked the eastern slope and Roosebeck Valley, taking many prisoners at Denny's and Ravine Woods. North of the canal, the 47th Division had to capture a spoil heap 400 yards long, where several German machine gun nests had been dug in. The British attacks established a footing on the heap at great cost, due to machine gun fire from the spoil heap and others in battle would further north. At 9 a.m. the infantry withdrew to allow the area to be bombarded from 2.30 to 6.55 p.m. for an attack by a reserve battalion at 7 p.m. The 23rd Division had many casualties caused by flanking machine gun fire from the spoil heap while clearing battle wood, which took until the evening dot in the center of the attack, a company from each battalion advanced behind the barrage, to an observation line several hundred yards down the east slope of the ridge, at 8.40 am. Assisted by eight tanks and patrols of cavalry. Most German troops encountered surrendered quickly, except at Leg Copse and Oesterverne Wood where they offered slight resistance. British aircraft added to German difficulties, with low-level machine gun attacks. The second objective from Bethlehem Farm to south of Mazines, Despain Farm, and Oestervern Wood, was reached with few casualties. Ground markers were put out for the three divisions due to attack in the afternoon and the area consolidated. The defensive frontages of the British units on the ridge had been based on an assumption that casualties in the advance to the first intermediate objective would be 50%, and in the advance to the ridge would be 60%. There were far fewer British casualties than anticipated, which caused congestion on the ridge, where the attacking troops suffered considerable casualties from German long-range machine gun, and artillery fire. The British planners expected that the two German Eingreif divisions behind the ridge would begin organized counter-attacks at about 11 am, and arranged for a long pause in the advance down the eastern slope, thereby enabling an attack from consolidated defensive positions, rather than an encounter in the open while the British were still advancing. The masked batteries of the three reserve divisions were used to add to the protective barrage in front of the infantry but no Germans could be seen. Chapter 3 Section 1 Subsection 4 Final Objective A pause of five hours was considered necessary to defeat the German Eingreif divisions, before resuming the advance on the Oestavern line. The pause was extended by two hours to 3.10 p.m., after Plumer received reports on the state of the ground. More artillery joined the masked batteries close to the front line and others moved as far into no man's land as the terrain allowed. On the near side of the ridge, 146 machine guns were prepared to fire an overhead barrage, and each division placed 16 more guns in the observation line on the eastern slope. The 24 tanks in reserve began to advance at 10.30 am to join two Anzac Corps and nine Corps on the flanks. Surviving tanks of the morning attack in X Corps, were to join in from Dam and Denny's Woods. The 4th Australian Division continued the attack on the 2nd Anzac Corps front, the right-hand brigade reaching the assembly areas by 11.30 am, before learning of the postponement. The brigade had to lie on open ground under German artillery and machine gun fire, which caused considerable loss but the left brigade was informed in time to hold back until 1.40 pm the bombardment began to creep down the slope at 3.10 pm at a rate of 100 yards in 3 minutes. The right brigade advanced on a 2,000 yards front towards the Oestavern line, from the river Douve north to the Blauer Portbeek. German machine gunners in the pillboxes of the Oestavern line caused many casualties but with support from three tanks the Australians reached the pillboxes, except for those to the north of the Mazines-Warnerton Road. 
As the Australians outflanked the strong points, the Germans tried to retreat through the British barrage, which had stopped moving 300 yards beyond the rear trench of the Oestavern line. The left flank brigade was stopped on its right flank by fire from the German pillboxes north of the Mazines Warnerton Road up to the Blauer Portbeek, 500 yards short of the Oestavern line, with many casualties. The left battalion, unaware that the 33rd Brigade to the north had been delayed, veered towards the northeast to try to make contact near Lum Farm, which took the battalion across the Wambeck Spur instead of straight down. The objective was easily reached but at the Womack, 1,000 yards north of the intended position. The Australians extended their line further north to Polka Staminet trying to meet the 33rd Brigade, which arrived at 4.30 p.m. with four tanks. The brigade took Joy and Van Hove farms beyond the objective, silencing the machine guns being fired from them. On the 9th Corps front, the 33rd Brigade had been ordered to advance to Van Damme Farm at 9.25 a.m. but the message was delayed and the troops did not reach the assembly area at Roman's Farm until 3.50 p.m., half an hour late. To cover the delay, the Corps commander ordered the 57th Brigade from reserve, to take the Oestavern line from Van Hove Farm to Oestavern Village then to Bugwood, so that only the southern 1,200 yards were left for the 33rd Brigade. These orders were also delayed and the 19th Division commander asked for a postponement then ordered the 57th Brigade to advance without waiting for the 33rd Brigade. The troops only knew that they were to advance downhill and keep up to the barrage but were able to occupy the objective in 20 minutes against light opposition, meeting the Australians at Polka Staminet. Two brigades of the 24th Division in Corps Reserve advanced into the ex-Corps sector and reached Damstrasse on time. The brigades easily reached their objectives around Bugwood, Rosewood, and Verhast Farm, taking unopposed many German pillboxes. The brigades captured 289 Germans and six field guns for a loss of six casualties, advancing 800 yards along the Rusebeek Valley, then took Ravine Wood unopposed on the left flank. The left battalion was drawn back to meet the 47th Division, which was still held up by machine gun fire from the spoil bank. The final objectives of the British offensive had been taken, except for the area of the Ypres Comines Canal near the spoil bank and 1,000 yards of the Oestavern line, at the junction of the 2nd Anzac Corps and 9 Corps. Despite a heavy bombardment until 6.55 p.m., the Germans at the spoil bank repulsed another infantry attack. The reserve battalion which had been moved up for the second attack on the spoil bank, had been caught in a German artillery bombardment while assembling for the attack. The companies which attacked then met with massed machine gun fire during the advance and only advanced halfway to the spoil bank. The 207 survivors of the original 301 infantry, were withdrawn when German reinforcements were seen arriving from the canal cutting and no further attempts were made. The situation near the Blauer Portbeek worsened, when German troops were seen assembling near Steingast Farm, close to the Warnerton Road. A British SOS barrage fell on the 12th Australian Brigade, which was inadvertently digging in 250 yards beyond its objective. The Australians stopped the German counter-attack with small arms fire but many survivors began to withdraw spontaneously, until they stopped in relative safety on the ridge. As darkness fell and being under the impression that all the Australians had retired, New Zealand artillery observers called for the barrage to be brought closer to the observation line, when they feared a German counter-attack. The bombardment fell on the rest of the Australians, who withdrew with many casualties, leaving the southern part of the Oestavern line unoccupied, as well as the gap around the Blauerportbeek. An SOS barrage on the 9th Corps front stopped a German counter-attack from the Rusebeck Valley but many shells fell short, precipitating another informal withdrawal. Rumour led to the barrage being moved closer to the observation line, which added to British casualties until 10pm, when the infantry managed to get the artillery stopped and were then able to reoccupy the positions. Operations to retake the Oestavern line in the 2nd Anzac Corps area started at 3 a.m. on 8 June. Chapter 3 Section 2 – Air Operations As the infantry moved to the attack contact patrol aircraft flew low overhead, 
two being maintained over each core during the day. The observers were easily able to plot the positions of experienced troops, who lit flares and waved anything to attract attention. Some troops, poorly trained and inexperienced, failed to cooperate, fearing exposure to the Germans so aircraft flew dangerously low to identify them, for being shot down in consequence. Although air observation was not as vital to German operations because of their control of commanding ground, the speed by which reports from air observation could be delivered, made it a most valuable form of liaison between the front line and, and higher commanders. German infantry proved as reluctant to reveal themselves as the British so German flyers also had to make visual identifications. Reports and maps were dropped at divisional headquarters and corps report centers, allowing the progress of the infantry to be followed dot during the pause on the ridge crest, an observer reported that the Ostervern line was barely occupied, at 2 p.m. a balloon observer reported a German barrage on the second Anzac Corps front and a counter-attack patrol aircraft reported German infantry advancing either side of Mazines. The German counter-attack was crushed by artillery fire by 2.30 p.m. Each Corps squadron kept an aircraft on counter-attack patrol all day, to call for barrage fire if German troops were seen in the open but the speed of the British advance resulted in few German counter-attacks. Artillery observers watched for German gunfire and made 398 zone calls but only 165 managed to have German guns engaged. The observers regulated the bombardment of the Oestervern line and the artillery of 8 Corps to the north of the attack, which was able to enfilade German artillery opposite X Corps. 14 fighters were sent to conduct low altitude strafes on German ground targets ahead of the British infantry and rove behind German lines, attacking infantry, transport, gun teams, and machine gun nests. The attacks continued all day, two of the fighters being shot down. Organized attacks were made on the German airfields at Bissigam and Mark near Courtrai and the day bombing squadrons attacked airfields at Ramagny's Chin, Cuckoo, Bissigam, and Rumbeck. Reports of German troops concentrating from Kanoi to Warnerton were received and aircraft set out to attack them within minutes. German fighters made a considerable effort to intercept Corps observation aircraft over the battlefield but were frustrated by patrols on the barrage line and offensive patrols beyond, only one British Corps aircraft was shot down by German aircraft. After dark, the night bombing specialists of 100 Squadron bombed railway stations at Warnerton, Menin, and Courtrai. The situation at the north end of the 2nd Anzac Corps front was discovered by air reconnaissance, at dawn on the 8th of June. Chapter 3 Section 3, German 4th Army At 2.50 am on the 7th of June, the British artillery bombardment ceased, expecting an immediate infantry assault, the German defenders returned to their forward positions. At 3.10 am the mines were detonated, killing circa 10,000 German soldiers and destroying most of the middle breastwork of the front system, paralyzing the survivors of the 11 German battalions in the front line, who were swiftly overrun. The explosions occurred while some of the German frontline troops were being relieved, catching both groups in the blasts and British artillery fire resumed at the same moment as the explosions. Some of the Stostruppen in Brestwerkik were able to counter-attack but were overwhelmed quickly as the British advanced on the Sonnestalung which usually held half of the support battalions but had been reduced to about 100 men and six machine guns, in each 800 yards regimental zone. Smoke and dust from the British barrage limited visibility to 100 yards and some defenders thought that figures moving towards them were retreating German soldiers, were taken by surprise and overrun. After a pause, the British continued to the Hohenstellung held by half of the support battalions, a company of each reserve battalion and 10 to 12 machine guns per regimental sector. Despite daylight, German defenders only saw occasional shapes in the dust and smoke as they were deluged by artillery fire and machine gunned by swarms of British aircraft. The German defense in the south collapsed and uncovered the left flank of each unit further north in turn, forcing them to retire to the Seinenstellung. Some German units held out in Weichstadt and near St. Eloy, waiting to be relieved by counter-attacks which never came. The garrison of the Kofferberg held on for 36 hours until relieved. 
Laffert had expected that the two Eingrave divisions behind Mazines Ridge would reach the Hohenstalung before the British. The divisions had reached assembly areas near Gaelevelt and Warnerton by 7 a.m. and the 7th Division was ordered to move from Zanvoort to Hollebeck, to attack across the Comines Canal towards Widescheid on the British northern flank. The 1st Guard Reserve Division was to move to the Warnerton line east of Mazines, then advance around Mazines to recapture the original front system. Both Eingrave divisions were plagued by delays, being new to the area and untrained for counter-attack operations. The 7th Division was shelled by British artillery all the way to the Comines Canal, then part of the division was diverted to reinforce the remnants of the front divisions holding positions around Hollebeck. The rest of the division found that the British had already taken the Seine and Stalung. By the time that they arrived at 4 pm, the 1st Guard Reserve Division was also bombarded as it crossed the Warnerton Line but reached the area east of Mazines by 3 pm, only to be devastated by the resumption of the British creeping barrage and forced back to the Seine and Stalung as the British began to advance to their next objective. Laffert contemplated a further withdrawal, then ordered the existing line to be held after the British advance stopped. Most of the losses inflicted on the British infantry by the German defence came from artillery fire. In the days after the main attack, German shell fire on the new British lines was extremely accurate and well-timed, inflicting 90% of the casualties suffered by the 25th Division. Chapter 4 Aftermath Chapter 4 Section 1 Analysis Historians and writers disagree on the strategic significance of the battle, although most describe it as a British tactical and operational success. In 1919, Ludendorff wrote that the British victory cost the German army dear and drained German reserves. Hindenburg wrote that the losses at Mazines had been very heavy and that he regretted that the ground had not been evacuated. In 1922, Kuhl called it one of the worst German tragedies of the war. In his Dispatches of 1920, Haig described the success of the British plan, organization and results but refrained from hyperbole, referring to the operation as a successful preliminary to the main offensive at Ypres. In 1930, Basil Liddlehart thought the success at Mazines inflated expectations for the Third Battle of Ypres and that because the circumstances of the operations were different, attempts to apply similar tactics resulted in failure. In 1938 Lloyd George called the battle an imperatif and in 1939, G. C. Wynne judged it to be a brilliant success, overshadowed by the subsequent tragedy of the battles of Passchendaele. James Edmonds, the official historian, called it a great victory in military operations France and Belgium 1917 Part 2, published 1948. Pryor and Wilson called the battle a noteworthy success but then complained about the decision to postpone exploitation of the success on the Gaelevelt Plateau. Ashley Ekins referred to the battle as a great set-piece victory, which was also costly, particularly for the infantry of two Anzac Corps, as did Christopher Pugsley, referring to the experience of the New Zealand division. Heinz Hagenlock called it a great British success and that the loss of the ridge had a worse effect on German morale than the number of casualties. Jack Sheldon called it a significant victory for the British and a disaster for the German army, which was forced into a lengthy period of anxious waiting. Ian Brown in his 1996 PhD thesis and Andy Simpson in 2001 concluded that extending British supply routes over the ridge, which had been devastated by the mines and millions of shells, to consolidate the Oestavern line was necessary. Completion of the infrastructure further north in the 5th Army area, had to wait before the northern operation could begin and was the main reason for the operational pause in June and July. Chapter 4 Section 2 casualties. In 1941, Charles Bean, the Australian official historian, recorded two Anzac Corps casualties from 1 to 14 June as 4,978 in the New Zealand Division, 3,379 in the 3rd Australian Division and 2,677 casualties in the 4th Australian Division. In 1948, James Edmonds, the British official historian, gave casualties of 12,391 in the 2nd Anzac Corps, 5,263 in 9 Corps, 
6,597 in X-Core, 108 in 2-Core and 203 in 8-Core, a total of 24,562 from 1 to 12 June. The 25th Division History gave 3,052 casualties and the 47th Division History notes 2,303 casualties. Using figures from the Reichsarchive, been recorded German casualties for 21 to the 31st of May as 1,963, from 1 to 10 June 19, 923, from 11 to 20 of June. 5,501 and 1,773 from 21 to 30 June. In Volume 12 of Der Weltkrieg the German official historians recorded 25,000 casualties for the period the 21st May to the 10th June including 10,000 missing of whom 7,200 were reported as taken prisoner by the British. The Reichsarchive count of British casualties was 25,000 and and a further 3,000 missing from 18 May to the 14th of June. The explosion of the mines, in particular the mine that created the Lone Tree Crater, accounts for the high number of casualties and missing from 1 to 10 June. The German medical history, Sanitatsberg über das Deutschen Heeres im Weltkrieg, recorded 26,087 German casualties from 7 to 14 June. Edmonds recorded 21,886 German casualties, including 7,548 missing, from 21 May to the 10th of June, using strength returns from Gruppen Ypern, Weidschiet and Liel in Der Weltkrieg, the German official history, then wrote that 30% should be added for wounded likely to return to duty within a reasonable time since they were omitted in the German official history. Reasoning which has been disputed by other historians. In 2007 Sheldon gave 22,988 casualties for the German 4th Army from 1 to the 10th of June 1917. Chapter 4 Section 3 Subsequent Operations At 3 a.m. on the 8th of June, the British attack to regain the Oestavern line from the River Douve to the Warnerton Road found few German garrisons present as it was occupied. German artillery south of the Lys bombarded the southern slopes of the ridge and caused considerable losses among Anzac troops pinned there. Ignorance of the situation north of the Warnerton Road continued, a reserve battalion was sent to reinforce the 49th Australian Battalion near the Blauerportbeek for the 3M attack which did not take place. The 4th Australian Division Commander, Major General William Holmes, went forward at 4 a.m. and finally clarified the situation. New orders instructed the 33rd Brigade, 11th Division, to sidestep to the right and relieve the 52nd Australian Battalion, which at dusk would move to the south and join the 49th Australian Battalion to attack into the gap at the Blauer Port Beak. All went well until observers on the ridge saw the 52nd Australian Battalion withdrawing, mistook it for a German counter-attack and called for an SOS bombardment. German observers in the valley saw troops from the 33rd Brigade moving into the area to relieve the Australians, mistook them for an attacking force and also called for an SOS bombardment. The area was deluged with artillery fire from both sides for two hours, causing many casualties and the attack was postponed until 9 June. Confusion had been caused by the original attacking divisions on the ridge having control over the artillery covering the area occupied by the reserve divisions down the eastern slope. The arrangement had been intended to protect the ridge from large German counter-attacks, which might force the reserve divisions back up the slope. The mistaken bombardments of friendly troops ended late on 9 June, when the New Zealand, 16th and 36th Divisions were withdrawn into reserve and the normal corps organization was restored, the anticipated large German counter-attacks had not occurred. On 10 June, the attack down the Blauer Portbeek began but met strong resistance from the fresh German 11th Division, brought in from Group E. The 3rd Australian Division advanced 600 yards either side the River Douve, consolidating their hold on a rise around Thatched Cottage which secured the right flank of the new Mazines position, early on the 11th of June, the Germans evacuated the Blauer Portlick sector. British observation from the Oestavern line proved to be poor, which led Plumer to order an advance further down the slope. On the 14th of June, 
The second Anzac Corps was to push forward on the right from Plug Street, Wood to Toitiul Farm and Hill 20 and another 1,000 yards to the Gapard Spur and Femme de la Croix. Nine Corps was to take Joy Farm, the Wambeck Hamlet and come level with the Australians at Delport Farm, X Corps was to capture the spoil bank and the areas adjacent. The attack was forestalled by a German retirement on the night of 10 the 11th of June and by the 14th of June, British advanced posts had been established without resistance. Meticulously planned and well executed, the attack on the Mazines Wycheat Ridge secured its objectives in less than 12 hours. The combination of tactics devised on the Somme and at Arras, the use of mines, artillery survey, creeping barrages, tanks, aircraft and small unit fire and movement tactics, created a measure of surprise and allowed the attacking infantry to advance by infiltration when confronted by intact defences. Well-organised mopping up parties prevented bypassed, German troops from firing on advanced troops from behind. The British took 7,354 prisoners, 48 guns, 218 machine guns and 60 trench mortars. The offensive secured the southern end of the Ypres salient in preparation for the British northern operation. Laffert, the commander of Gruppe Weidschgate, was sacked two days after the battle. Haig had discussed the possibility of rapid exploitation of a victory at Mazines with Plumer before the attack, arranging for two and eight corps to advance either side of Belward Lake, using some of the artillery from the Mazines front, which Plumer considered would take three days to transfer. On the 8th of June, Patrols on the two and eight corps fronts reported strong resistance. Haig urged Plumer to attack immediately and Plumer replied that it would still take three days to arrange. Haig transferred the two corps to the 5th Army and that evening, gave instructions to Goff to plan the preliminary operation to capture the area around Stirling Castle. On the 14th of June, Goff announced that the operation would put his troops into a salient, and that he wanted to take the area as part of the main offensive. On 13 June, German aircraft began daylight attacks on London and the southeast of England, leading to the diversion of British aircraft from the concentration of air forces for the northern operation. Chapter 4 Section 4 – Victoria Cross Private John Carroll, 33rd Battalion, 3rd Australian Division Lance Corporal Samuel Frickleton 3rd Battalion, New Zealand Rifles, New Zealand Division. Captain Robert Cuthbert Grieve, 37th Battalion, 3rd Australian Division. Private William Ratcliffe, 2nd South Lancashire Regiment, 25th Division.